I'm Harry Smith in for Joshua Johnson. Good to be with you on this Wednesday, the 1st of June. Here's some of what we're talking about tonight. Another mass shooting tonight, this one in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Police say at least four people are dead, including the gunman. Then, as families in Uvalde, Texas, continue to bury their dead, confusion grows over whether the school police chief is still cooperating with state investigators. Just what kind of damage does an assault weapon do to the human body? We'll speak to a trauma doctor. Who knows? And the jury comes to a split decision in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. We'll tell you what this means for their long battle over allegations of domestic abuse. We have breaking news tonight from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Police say a number of people have been shot inside a hospital there. At least four people have been killed, including the suspect. Police say he took his own life. It's, uh, we will have more on that story from Tulsa, Tulsa later in the broadcast. It was a six-week trial that was must-stream TV. And after nearly 13 hours of deliberations, the jury has awarded both Johnny Depp and his ex-wife, Amber Heard, damages for their defamation claims. The jury found that Depp was defamed by Heard based on the op-ed she wrote in the Washington Post in 2018, calling herself a, quote, public figure representing domestic abuse. But, and here's the thing, the jury found that Heard had also been defamed by a statement made by, made by one of Depp's lawyers. The jury awarded Depp a total of $15 million of the 15 million he of the 50 million he sued for. That's 10 million in comp compensatory damages and 5 million in punitive damages. The judge later lowered the punitive damages to $350,000, the legal limit. The jury awarded her $2 million, falling significantly short of the 100 million for which she countersued. NBC's uh, Ron Allen joins us now from outside the courthouse in Fairfax, Virginia. Good evening. What I, every time I looked up at the television, I saw you talking from outside the courthouse there. What was it, what was it like out there all day today? You know, Harry, this is really just a very bizarre six weeks of trial uh, culminating in all this. It, it actually ended pretty quickly. Uh, the, the, we thought that the jury might be out longer than the 13 hours that they were. And, and they came back and they just delivered a decisive verdict. Now, you can talk about the millions of dollars uh, that got, Def got uh, or her didn't get. Uh, but the feeling here and elsewhere is that Depp won this case, that he, uh, that, that he was right and that she was wrong, that he was the one who, as he put it in his statement, uh, you know, wanted his life back and got his life and his reputation back. He wasn't even here. He wasn't here at the courthouse today. He's in England uh, playing music concerts with, uh, with his friend Jeff Beck. Uh, his, uh, his team says that he's trying to you know, get back, uh, get his career back going and, and fulfill these obligations. Heard was here, and she left the courtroom uh, disappointed, visibly disappointed, very, very uh, angry and, and just feeling like, as she said in her statement, that um, uh, just completely deflated. Um, and people who supported her, I think, also were just surprised at how 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 Depp won each of the three counts essentially that the that the three allegations that he made and to for for the jury to side with him on those three issues those three defamation issues they basically mm. believed his argument that she was lying and that she wasn't a victim of abuse and that the whole thing was as they said in closing arguments a, a grand performance by her that the jury just didn't believe so this is the way it had been going in the court of public opinion and on social media. Depp was the winner. Mm. Heard was the loser. And that's what the jury has now said. And so they go on. How will this affect their careers? Depp's probably going to do pretty well, many people are saying. Heard, it's, it's unsure. And uh, I think a lot of people who supported her were just really surprised that this happened in, in the Me Too era. Uh, here's a yeah. woman who just was not believed. And uh, a lot of people said that she just wasn't a great witness and that she wasn't sincere. And all that came through, and the jury apparently uh, agreed. So here we there are. There you go. All right. Ron Allen, thank you so much. We do appreciate it. Live from Virginia with us this evening. 
Now joining us is David Henderson, a civil rights lawyer and a former prosecutor, and C.K. Hoffler, a veteran trial lawyer and former National Bar Association president. Good evening to you both. From what you were able to observe as this trial has been streamed and posted and talked about so much over the last number of weeks, from what you were able to observe, who won the case, the evidence or the lawyers? Well, I, the lawyers definitely did not win the case, Harry. And I say that because I think there's a basic understanding they didn't have about the way these cases are typically handled. And that is, the com jury completely lost fact of the fact that this was a defamation case and not a domestic violence case. Once it became a domestic violence case or it took on that tone, what juries typically do is, if there's any evidence of what they consider to be mutual combat, they will dismiss the case altogether. The defendant will normally get acquitted. In a case like this, where it's a civil trial, they'll do some version of splitting the baby based on who they like more. And that's essentially what you saw here. So lawyering played a really strong role because there's some basic ideas the lawyers lost track of as this case continued. That, you know, I'm so glad you brought up the differentiation between the civil and the criminal because people up there, as they're watching this unfold, I think there has been quite a lot of confusion. Ms. Hoffler, let's talk a little bit about uh, this court of public opinion. Because as Ron Allen said, it seemed to coincide what happened inside the courtroom today with what was going on outside the courtroom. Is it possible that that somehow drifted into their deliberations? Well, you know, Harry, whenever you've got such a high profile case, because you have high profile individuals litigating the case, and it's hard-fought litigation, it's sensationalized. You've got Hollywood integrated and, and you know celebrities coming into the courtroom, if you will, whether by video or in person, you're going to have the court of public opinion and social media weighing in. I do think that jurors are sophisticated enough, and I think this jury pool, these seven jurors seem to be sophisticated enough to be able to make a determination on their own. I did watch this trial from beginning to end. I did do legal commentary from beginning to end. And I do think that Amber Heard, unfortunately for her, um, there was there were too many inconsistencies. And I think that she did lack credibility, unfortunately, on many occasions. Johnny Depp did have the benefit of people really liking him. He's quite popular. He has a sort of air about him that I think probably even the jurors were persuaded by. But in a defamation case, it boils down to someone lying and someone telling the truth. It's just that simple. And if there is truth, it is an absolute defense of defamation. I've litigated First Amendment cases. They're very tough. But truth mm. is an absolute defense. They did not believe Amber Heard, period, end of discussion. And that's what the verdict Man. reflects. And I think the other thing that Ron said is also important in this as another chapter in, let's put it in quotation marks, the Me Too movement. What was one of the ones she said, Ms. Heard said this to me, she was sad about the outcome, sadder still that I seem to have lost a right that I had as an American to speak freely and openly. Ms. Hoffler. Well, you know, I don't know that Amber Heard was the best um, proponent of the Me Too movement, quite frankly. One piece of evidence that was not refuted and that came straight out of, out of her mouth was that she punched Johnny Depp. And everything else in terms of what he allegedly did or didn't do was, was contradicted in one way or another. So I don't know that I would agree that she was a strong proponent of the Me Too movement. So I can't mm -hmm. say that it was set it was, it was set behind, but I do think that the bar is much higher, much stronger for women. I'm an advocate on behalf of women, too, and it is difficult when you have these cases. I just don't believe that Amber Heard was the best example and the best proponent and the best test case for the Me Too movement. It's, Mr. Henderson, let me ask you this. Is it from your perspective, because we we'll go back not very long ago, Johnny Depp sues the son in the U.K., because there was a headline in a paper that said he was a wife beater. He sued. That was adjudicated by a judge in the UK, and he found for the paper. It's, you know, it's, it's, to me, as you're looking at this, it's apples and oranges, of course, and everything else, but in the UK, Andrew Nichol, uh, the judge, found uh, Depp uh, responsible in this regard. And here in the United States, with a, in a jury, with a, uh, a jury trial and lawyers, 
it's, um, it comes out the opposite direction. Is there a way to account for that, Mr. Anderson? Oh, 100 percent, Harry. And part of the way you account for that is to explain why people don't like jury trials, because they're risky and you don't know what the outcome is likely to be. Not only did the judge fine for the son in the UK, but there were 14 allegations of abuse by Depp against Heard, and the judge also found that 12 of those were true, which begs the question, why did you have such a different outcome here in this trial? And I think the basic mm. problem is that the lawyers didn't always understand how to present some of this information to a jury. I say that because I have tried every type of domestic violence case there is. I was a special crimes prosecutor. I have tried domestic violence cases from people pushing each other up to capital murder. And I think one of the assumptions people make is, hey, if I just get up there and I tell my story with sincerity and it's emotional, that people will believe me. And that's not how juries think. One of the hardest lessons to learn is that juries typically do not care about the individuals involved in the case. They're self-interested. They want to know how the outcome of this trial is likely to impact them. In addition, if you say things like, so-and-so saw such-and-such, which her and her lawyers said several times, the jury wants to hear from so-and-so in court and hear them describe such-and-such. Also, some of the assaults that she described were so brutal the juries will ask questions about, did you report this to the police? Did you tell someone close to you? Did you talk to a doctor during your yearly exam? And if you don't have evidence like that, they will hold that against the person who's offering the testimony. And in my experience, that's especially true if the person is a woman. Such insightful stuff from both David Henderson and C.K. Hoffler. I wonder, though, I remember a quote from an old uh, Reagan appointee from many years ago who was acquitted in a, in a trial, and he said, where do I go to get my reputation back? Or mm-hmm. does the court of a public opinion say, Johnny, you can go be a pirate again? Either of you want to intone on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, this is Hollywood. This is Hollywood at its best. I think Johnny Depp came out ahead I believe his reputation has been reestablished. He admitted on the stand, look, I may, he said, in other words, I may be a drunk. I may be a drug addict. I may have, be a bad person to have thrown things, but I'm not a wife beater. And it was the wife beating allegation that tanked his reputation. So in this instance, the reason why he's victorious is because this case, the jury did not believe a single word that she said about Johnny Depp beating her and being a wife beater. That's why he feels vindicated. It wasn't about the money for him. Although I will say this, even though Virginia had, you know, minimizes punitive damages, a $5 million punitive damages verdict by this jury, even it's been reduced because of Virginia law, is significant. They gave her zero, nothing in punitive damages for the one claim that his lawyer said something about her. Right. That's all yeah. very significant. So big victory for Johnny Depp. Right. We got to go. C.K. Hoffler, uh, thank you so much. Uh, David Henderson, the both of you, really terrific. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. Really appreciate it. Still to come, we have an update from Uvalde, Texas. We're going to check in to see how the community is saying goodbye to family members, classmates, and friends. Tonight, more families are saying their final goodbyes in Uvalde. One after another, people laying their loved ones to rest. Today, there were three more funerals. One for 48-year-old Irma Garcia, a teacher killed in the shooting. Another for her 50-year-old husband, Joe, who died of a heart attack just two days later. He collapsed after dropping off flowers at his wife's memorial. There was also a funeral for Jose Manuel Flores, Jr., one of the children killed in the school. His parents say he was on the honor roll and loved to help with babies in their home. Joining us right now live, NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson, who joins us from Uvalde. It's been quite an emotional day there, I understand. Yeah, it really has, Harry. It started earlier this morning when uh, the Border Patrol agents came out with a member of the Honor Guard and played the trumpet here as folks looked on, uh, played a song called On Eagle's Wings to memorialize and pay tribute to those victims. And just a short while ago, a bus full of mariachi players uh, came here. They represent mariachi bands, uh, more than 17 bands across San Antonio. 
and they came together, uh, the leader saying, because mariachi music is often used to heal and to console, and that's what they were hoping to do for this community here. And I was particularly struck by seven-year-old Mateo Lopez, uh, who sang a beautiful song about Mexico. And I want to play a little bit of his performance and also share a little bit of my conversation with him and his parents about what that song meant and why it was so important for his parents to bring him here today. Let's take a listen. for him to be part of this because, I mean, it was all the, the unfortunate children that lost their lives here were around his age. Um, and I just think Mateo is, would represent those kids. You know, it's, it's different when an adult comes out and sings, but when you have another child doing that. Adult. And people have been coming from all across the state to sort of share uh, in this grief and also to provide comfort. I spoke to another woman, woman who came an, from an hour and a half away to be here and light a candle and deliver flowers. And she said that she had watched all of the news coverage as things have unfolded over the past week. And she felt like she needed to be here uh, and to be with this community. And so uh, she came. And I think we're going to continue to see that certainly here at this memorial as those funerals and services for the victims continue uh, well into the next two weeks. Harry? It sure feels like this, what, what happened there last week has touched so many people just as you say it is literally lifting them out of their chairs they're getting in their cars they're going there because it's kids because it's happened again because on some level this is just some some kind of unforgivable sin that has been you know waited upon these poor children as they were in school and their teachers yeah, exactly, Harry. And I was really struck. There was actually a man here whose father died in a mass shooting in Dayton, Ohio, uh, a few years ago. And he said he was right there next to his dad whenever he died. And he said he wanted to be here because he knows that the real grieving for a lot of these families is going to begin after the services and after uh, the crowds are no longer at these memorials. And they have to go back to their day-to-day -day lives with that loss, with that person that is no longer there and he encouraged everyone here to continue to support this community through the long haul uh, because this grief it's going to last a lifetime harry priscilla thompson thank you so much live in Uvalde this evening a lot of you have been sending in ideas of how to prevent future shootings some have suggested adding weapons to schools here's what one person who wished to remain anonymous left in our inbox if teachers could be trained with the ability to use guns and something like that happened at a proper moment they might be able to shoot the shooter jay wrote us an email quote enhance the training of the officer assigned to each school train them give them body armor and automatic weapons rather than give teachers weapons it's a lot to uh, unpack here, as they say. With us now is Randy Weingarten. She is the president of the American Federation of Teachers, which represents 1.7 million teachers across the country. Randy, good, uh, welcome to you. Um, look, I hate being with you at this moment, Harry, but it's great to be with you. Um, you know that there's just been three more shootings today. Yeah, and we'll have more on that in just a little bit. Uh, can I ask you first, have you polled your teachers? Sure. What is their response to the idea of having them armed in the classroom? Hate it. They're just, you know, I, I mean, we are, we poll people all the time. We did it um, after Parkland. It was like 90%. Um, the Gallup poll and the other um, uh, public polls have said, you know, 75, 80% of teachers don't want to be um, armed with, um, with, with guns. Um, there are some states that allow this after Parkland, like um, Texas, and over 10 years, there's been about less than 300 people who have elected to do this. 
And and part wow. of it is, um, look, part of it is that we should be trusted with teaching curriculum. We should be trusted with doing what we know how to do, like, you know, meet kids' needs, teach curriculum, not have books banned and censored. And instead, because um, there are some politicians that don't want to get guns out of schools, they now all of a sudden trust us to do something that we've never been trained to do. And, and frankly, you really need, think about what happened in the last two shootings, in the Buffalo shooting and in the, um, in the Uvalde shooting. You have a, a gunman, 18-year-old, with an AR-15 that is capable of shooting 300 bullets at, you know, within a minute. Uh, we think that they wore body armor. So what is the teacher going to do? Like, and, 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 and what a teacher is trying to do is keep kids calm, keep them quiet, do all the things that they've been taught to do, and, and, and keep them steady. And so how do you think about that and, and try to think that you're going to shoot, uh, shoot something? It, it's just not within our impulse. Well, it, it just to go along with what you're saying, the Ohio Senate passed a bill today, a bill allowing education staff to carry guns in schools. Uh, that just happened today not, in response to like a, yeah. what happened. But what, but what it is, is it's not an answer. What anybody who's doing that, like the Ohio Senate and all these other folks, sorry, I'm in an airport. What, what they're doing is they're not getting to the root cause and the root solution they're just trying to, you know, placate the polit the, the you know the gun manufacturers and the cultural wars that have started on this. Um, if, if there's there is a common sense solution here, and there's a huge swath of Americans that believe in it, which is nobody's asking reason responsible gun owners to get rid of their guns. Nobody's asking to change the Second Amendment. What we're asking for is to do the kind of gun safety work that, you know, frankly, if you're a, a, a driver of a car, you have to follow the speed limit. So what's the reasonable gun safety, gun violence prevention? Background checks. Raise the age limit to 21. Ban these weapons of wars. Uh, do red flag laws. These are things that the vast amount of Americans really believe in. And what we need is for our politicians to actually right. listen to we the people. Just a yes or no question. The things that you just talked about have always been so far off the table, non-negotiables, a yes or no. Do you think in this moment in time they may even be even looked at? Yes. I think that things, I know you said one word, but I think that what's happened in the last few weeks is shocking the conscience. And I think people are saying, let's get something done on behalf of our kids. Randy Weingarten, we thank you for finding a place in a busy airport to speak with us this evening. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Thanks. Treating gunshot wounds is no easy task, especially wounds caused by assault weapons. We're going to speak to a trauma surgeon who not only treats those types of patients, but is a survivor of gun violence himself when we come back. We are following the deadly mass shooting in Tulsa, Oklahoma that happened earlier this evening. We want to go right now to NBC's Rahema Ellis. What's the latest, Rahema? Harry, I can tell you that authorities are just had a news conference just a few moments ago, and what they tell us is that five people are dead, including the shooter, after police say a man with a rifle entered a medical facility attached to St. Francis Hospital, and that's south of downtown. Authorities say the gunman went to the second floor, but it's too early to know why he chose that location. Police later confirming the shooter's death, but it's unclear if he took his own life. But now authorities are saying that he did take his life. They also say that uh, police were drawn to the second floor because they heard the sound of gunfire. <clears throat> and once again, while details are still coming in, friends and family were huddling together outside awaiting any news of loved ones. <clears throat> 
Also at this hour, police are providing new information, again, confirming that the shooter did die of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. They say the suspect was a black male, 35 to 40 years old, armed with one long gun rifle and a handgun. Police say they arrived on the scene three minutes after the shooting began, making contact with victims and the suspect five minutes later. Authorities say they're still accounting for the number of injuries. Meanwhile, the White House confirms that President Biden has been briefed and is keeping a close watch on the situation. Harry? And Rahima, just for the record, for at least as of this moment, it's five total, including the gunman? That is correct. Authorities say five people were killed, and it appears that it all happened on the second floor of this facility and that the gunman is among those five killed, and they say okay. that the gunman took his own life. Harry? Rahima Ellis, thank you so much. Well, the tragedy at Robb Elementary School tore the Uvalde community apart. People across the nation are coming together to help families recover. One anonymous donor gave $175,000 to cover funeral expenses. The NFL and the Dallas Cowboys have donated $400,000 to victims' families. And if you wish to donate, our partners at NBC in Dallas, Fort Worth, put together a list for how to donate. That list is available on our social media accounts at NBC Now Tonight. So all you need to do is check it out. There are other ways people are extending their support. Restaurants are sending food. Bakeries are hosting fundraisers. One craftsman has traveled to Uvalde to offer his services to families of those who were killed. And joining us now is Trey Gannon. He is the owner of Soul Shine Industries, and he's with us live. Trey, good evening. Good evening, sir. You know, I saw a piece about you a couple of years ago, and I was intrigued because what you do for a living, I understand, is create spectacular representations of how people would uh, like to see themselves outfitted in a casket. Elvis, you name it, the tributes to, to all kinds of different things. Really amazing stuff. That's what you do. And... If that's what you do, what was it about what happened in Uvalde? What made you say, I've got to go there? Uh, man, I was reached out to immediately uh, when this happened by numerous people because they know what I do and, and how I specialize in things. And, you know, it's very emotional for me to be able to do this for these families. And um, it's something special. You know, it's the last thing that we can do for them. Um, but when I got that call, I, I immediately just jumped into action and um, grabbed my secretary. I said, let's go. I said, we have to go help these families. Um, met with the funeral directors down there and uh, just sitting with the families, uh, learning what their loved ones um, were into, what they loved. And we incorporate that into every piece of art that we do. And, you know, this comes from my heart and, and, and it's, it's, uh, you know, I never wanted to do children when, whenever I started to do caskets, mm -hmm. I had a friend pass away at a young age and, and I went to his service and I'm like, why is he in this? You know, we, we hunted together and, and, and I'm like, we should have camouflage or deer skin, something that would bring back the campfire stories. So, um, the worst thing a parent has to do is bury their child. But the hardest part is picking a casket um, because you can do everything and you're talking about. But when you walk in and you see this box that you're going to put your kid in, um, that's final. But when we sit down and talk to them, it just becomes amazing because they start telling us the stories, what they love, the superheroes, the, the, the softball. You know, it, it brings back that spark. They'll start telling you one thing and then all of a sudden they'll, oh, but wait, I need to make sure we have this. and and. You know, those are the little things that I incorporate to make this perfect for them. Wow. Just looking at the pictures of the caskets of these children, seeing the Superman emblem or the dinosaur or just even the color pink. Have, do you know for sure if some of the family members have been able to see them and have, have, have they reported back to you just their feelings at, yeah. at, at what you've been able to provide for them? I have chills right now when you're talking and, and, um, uh, you know, you can't give yourself chills, but 
Yes, I, I've heard from him, and it, it, the the response is is it takes my breath away and warms my heart. You know, I become part of these families when I talk to them and and learn what they like. But when they see it, and you get that phone call, and just oh my God, it's so perfect, and you know the it it was so him or so her, and and it 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 stings that I can't be there to give them a hug when they receive it. But that phone call. Um, mm you know, it's, it's validation that God has sent me this way and I'm doing the right thing. You know what else though? I mean, in the end of the day, cause these families will have all these pictures of their kids, you know, in little league or soccer or in tumbling or, you know, whatever activity or singing in the, in the school pageant, they're also going to have a picture of that casket and, you know, um, that's going to tug on their hearts, but it's going to make them smile. They may they may have tears in their eyes while they're smiling, but they're going to smile too. That's Trey Gannon. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. What a service for those folks back there in Uvalde. Perhaps this conversation about what happened in Uvalde, what happened in Buffalo and elsewhere is not complete without discussing the fierce capabilities of assault weapons. In a new poll, 67% of Americans strongly or somewhat support a ban on assault-style weapons, and President Biden agrees. It makes no sense to be able to purchase something that can fire up to 300 rounds. There's only one reason for something that can fire, you know, 100 shots. According to a piece published by the Brookings Institution, bullets from assault rifles travel three hundred three times faster than conventional low-velocity handguns. The impact that has on the human body is nothing short of consequential. Here to give us a better sense of that damage is Dr. Joseph Sacrin. He's a trauma surgeon and the director of emergency general surgery at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Sacrin is also a victim of gun violence himself. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thanks so much, Harry, and thanks for having me. Uh, let's first talk a little bit about what happened to you. You were in high school, and a, a bullet from a 2022 20, ended up where? Yeah, so, you know, I come to this conversation of gun violence in America as someone who is a survivor after nearly being killed when I was shot in the throat with a 38 caliber bullet. And now, unfortunately, uh, I have to see this public health problem from a different vantage point, and that's as a trauma surgeon taking care of these critically injured patients on a daily basis. I'm sorry, I got the caliber wrong. Let's talk about this, and for some in the audience, we want to warn them that this discussion can, in fact, end up being fairly graphic. As someone has seen this with their own eyes, can you talk a little bit, at least in general terms, about the kind of damage that is done to a human body by the ammunition from an AR-15. Yeah, so Harry, there is a dramatic difference when you compare a handgun versus an assault rifle. First and foremost, the speed of an assault rifle, as you mentioned, is substantially higher than that of a handgun and therefore results in massive tissue destruction from the energy that it imparts. And there's really two important factors. The first is this permanent cavity, and that's the path in which the bullet is going to create. The second is what's called a temporary cavity. And if you can imagine a boat that's traveling across a body of water, you know, a boat creates a wake behind it, and that wake is the temporary cavity. So the faster the boat goes, the larger the wake. And that's exactly similar to what happens with these bullets from these assault rifles. The more energy, the greater the cavitation and the greater the amount of tissue destruction one's going to see. This may be the toughest question of all. When the bullets that you just talked about, is there a difference between what happens when that kind of bullet hits a child versus hitting an adult? Yeah, you know, if you can only begin to imagine the anguish that parents went through following the massacre of these 19 children in Uvalde, when they were not only told that their son or daughter was never coming home, 
but they had to identify their child, some of whom may not have been recognizable. It's absolutely horrifying. And there's no other way to put this to, than to say a military style assault rifle, like an AR-15, on those little bodies, on those precious small babies, results in nothing less than massive tissue destruction, dismemberment, and is a very effective tool in ensuring death. The fact that parents were asked for DNA tests is one demonstration of how horrific the injury patterns must have been. Do you think if more people were aware of the destructive ability of these guns that it might make a difference in terms of legislation? You know, it's interesting. We have this discussion uh, all the time. And in fact, even uh, Juliet Kayam, uh, one of my former professors from the Kennedy School, was talking about how these shootings are often sanitized. And should we really kind of peel back the curtain and let the American people see, you know, the devastating and gruesome injuries that are happening and what's happening on the front line? You know, will that work? I'm not 100% sure, but it's something that we, we think about constantly because the reality is, is that these are not just numbers and statistics. These are human beings, they're loved ones, they're members of our family, they're part of the social fabric of our community. And it's just absolutely unacceptable that we continue to wake up in America and see these senseless tragedies that happen day in and day out. And I can't accept that. And I think, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I would just add, as to wrap up, the CDC and the AMA have referred to gun violence as a public health crisis, some call it an epidemic. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talk about the mass shootings often, and understandably, they get a lot of attention. But Harry, let me tell you, in cities like Baltimore, we have young brown and black men, pregnant women, high school students that are being slaughtered on our streets on a daily basis. And so, the mass shootings are a fraction of this overall public health problem, and we have to approach it in that manner if we're going to actually make communities safer. Dr. Joseph Sacron, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us this evening. Much appreciated, sir. Thanks so much for having me, Harry. Right. After the break, the White House is working to get more baby formula on store shelves. How? Just ahead. As you might guess, it is still hard to find baby formula. But according to the White House, more shipments of imported formula will arrive next week. About 3.7 million bottles worth of Kendamil will come from London. And about 4.6 million bottles worth of Bubs will come from Melbourne. Despite that, today President Biden said the shortage is expected to last another two months. NBC's Jolene Kent has more. President Biden acknowledging he did not know about the formula crisis for two months following the closure of the critical Abbott manufacturing plant in Michigan. I became aware of this problem sometime in after April, in early April, about how intense it was. But moments earlier in his meeting with top manufacturers. We knew from the very beginning this would be a very serious event. We could foresee that this was going to create a tremendous shortage. Did the CEOs just tell you that they understood it would have a very big impact? They did, but I didn't. FDA officials were alerted to potential problems at the plant in October when an Abbott whistleblower sent FDA officials this 34-page document alleging that lax practices, including regulatory violations, were consistently overlooked. The FDA did not send a team to investigate until January 31st. Abbott shut down the plant on February 15th and issued a voluntary recall two days later. That same day, the FDA put out a warning to parents. Now, President Biden says he didn't become aware until April. But the president not publicly commenting on the crisis until May 13th, when he faced bipartisan criticism for a slow response. There's nothing more urgent. Late today, the White House press secretary saying administration officials were 
were working on the problem for weeks before the president says he was briefed. We did everything that we can from the moment uh, that we learned about the recall. I would have to talk to him about, about the April date. In that meeting with major manufacturers, Abbott was noticeably absent. A senior administration official telling NBC News the company at the center of this crisis was not invited. Abbott is currently cooperating with the FDA to reopen its shuttered plant in Sturgis, Michigan, set for this weekend. This comes after President Biden announced new emergency formula flights from the United Kingdom and Australia expected to hit shelves later this month. And it can't come soon enough for parents like mom Celeste Donahue in Northern California. She's driven up to Oregon to find the formula she needs for her 10-month-old baby boy. The bottom line is we can't do this. We, there should be formula on the shelves in the store. Jolene Kent, thanks. We'll get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including the U.S. sending advanced rocket systems to Ukraine. And they get there in time. Plus, a tropical storm could be headed toward Florida. We'll bring you the forecast. And Queen Elizabeth is getting ready to celebrate 70 years on the throne, a preview of the Platinum Jubilee. All ahead. Stay close. We begin tonight's headlines with Ukraine. Today, the White House and the Pentagon announced a military aid package, $700 million worth this time. More importantly, this package includes long-range missile systems, something Ukraine had been asking of the U.S. and its Western allies for for quite a while. The package also includes more javelins, more Mi-17 helicopters, and more tactical weapons. In an op-ed in the New York Times, President Biden emphasized that the advanced missiles are not, quote, encouraging or enabling Ukraine to strike beyond its borders, unquote. Ukraine has welcomed the package. Russia, on the other hand, is accusing the U.S. of, quote, deliberately adding fuel to the fire, unquote, by supplying advanced rockets to Ukraine. This comes as Russia is carrying out a ruthless offensive in eastern Ukraine. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter has more. Now all of the focus once again is on that key city in the Luhansk uh, region in the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine called Sever Donetsk. Now as of yesterday it was still largely in Ukrainian control. That has changed today. So according to uh, the city military administration, 60% of that city, the eastern part of that city, is now under Russian control. An estimated 20% is still uh, under Ukrainian control, with the remaining area kind of a no man's land. This is happening quickly. It is changing quickly. So that may uh, once again be updated uh, before the sun sets today. What is important to know is that there are still civilians inside. So that front line cuts through the city. There are still an estimated 12,000 people still inside. These are elderly people. These are people who are sick, could not easily evacuate. There are no more rides out of the city, no more evacuations possible. It is too dangerous and no more humanitarian aid getting in. What's happening today is that Russia is also uh, basically strategically, strategically, excuse me, bombing a lot of the small villages to encroach on that territory, to move into Severodonetsk and really close off. We've been talking about kind of a pocket in the Donbass region, a bubble on the map, essentially. They are trying to completely close off that uh, whole region. Now, the new military aid coming from the U.S., including longer range artillery, part of that $700 million package, which also includes javelins. Ukrainian soldiers, Ukrainian fighters, Ukrainian officials uh, here near the capital have been asking for longer range artillery for weeks now. And this new shipment, this new uh, package is coming too late for the Donbass region. The defense minister speaking today said that they are entering a critical phase of this war. They still lack a lot of the heavy weaponry. Quickly, though, we're in Bucha. We're just outside of the capital. And it is so different than when I was last here about five weeks ago. This was a city that was occupied by Russian forces for about five weeks. And I just want to point out this church at the end of the road. Behind that church was one of the city's biggest mass graves. Last time I was there in mid-April, not only was it driving rain, you also had uh, investigators, international investigators, exhuming bodies. They were taking the bodies out of those mass graves and trying to identify people. Now when you go back behind there, there's green grass growing. It has been flat and there are flowers. It is entirely different scene. The city is trying to rebuild. Of course, the big question, though, is not only kind of the physical infrastructure, but how do you heal a place that survived uh, what Bucha did? I'll send it back to you. Molly Hunter in Ukraine tonight. Thanks. Today is the first day of the Atlantic hurricane season. Things are getting 
interesting in the Gulf of Mexico because of the remnants of Agatha. That storm became the strongest Pacific hurricane on record when it made landfall over the weekend, causing flooding and mudslides that killed at least 11 people. NBC's news meteorologist Bill Karens has more on where Agatha is heading next. Well, good evening to you, Harry, and this is the first day of hurricane season, and we did make it through the first day without getting our first A-name storm, but we're not going to go many more. It does look like we're going to have a storm developing and heading towards the U.S. by the weekend. So here's the list of the names for this tropical season, and this will be the first A-name storm, Alex. And if you remember, the last two years, we made it all the way through the alphabet, so well, that's pretty rare. That's only happened three times before in history, so we'll see how far we get in the alphabet. Typically, when we get to the peak of the season, September and October, that's when we're typically in like the L's and the J's and the K's. That's why if you look back at the history, like the Katrina's, a lot of our huge big storms have been in the middle of the alphabet. So if we go through all of those names, we do hit on what we call the supplemental names. So in case we go through the entire list, then we'd have what, we don't do the Greek alphabet anymore. It's what they used to do a couple of years ago. So this is a supplemental list of names. And again, this is the three years that we've gone through all the names. Notice 2020, 2021, and also that really busy year of 2005. So how about the storm we're watching now? This was Agatha that hit Mexico as a hurricane. It's kind of been wandering over the Yucatan Peninsula and the higher terrain, and now it's starting to spin out here and get over warmer waters in the Western Caribbean. This is a favorable area of development. Even early in the season in June, water's plenty warm. So if the upper level winds are all, are all right, we should see this thing turning into a tropical depression. And the Hurricane Center says at least an 80% chance that it becomes a tropical depression. And this is what they call the development zone when it becomes a tropical depression then it'll be somewhere between cancun and possibly near florida odds are likely be as we go through either friday afternoon or evening maybe saturday morning as it's approaching areas here from fort myers towards key west and this is what our european computer model it's our most accurate long-range computer and you notice by 6 a.m on friday it's over the top of cancun then it begins to strengthen a little bit a big shield of rain coming into florida so if you have travel plans from tampa southwards orlando southwards especially fort myers in Naples, the Keys, all the way into Miami. A lot of problems at the airports come for late Friday night and then all day Saturday as what should be a tropical depression, maybe a tropical storm right over the top of you. And then as we head towards the end of the weekend, this is Sunday night, it's safely off the coast, but close enough for our friends in the Carolinas that we'll have to keep an eye on this in the days ahead. The biggest issues in Florida will be a potential from flash flooding. I don't think the winds are going to be high enough to cause a lot of problems, but we'll have to wait and see how much rain does fall, possibility of upwards of seven inches. As far as severe weather goes, this is still the peak period of severe storms. we got like 41 million people at risk of severe storms today. And then as we go towards tomorrow, heads up to all of our friends in the mid-Atlantic region, from Philly to Baltimore to D.C. to Fredericksburg. This area is under what we call a slight risk of severe storms. 18 million people at risk. And if you've ever been through a Washington, D.C. rush hour with severe storms around, it's not fun. And that's what we'll possibly be dealing with come tomorrow. And then finally, our friends in Oklahoma and in areas of Texas and Wichita towards Kansas City, this area is finally drying out, Harry. They've had a lot of rain, still under some flash flood watches, but that'll be expiring later tonight. All eyes this weekend, though, on Florida and what happens with possibly our first tropical system of the season in the Atlantic. Bill Cairns, thanks. The Queen's Jubilee is a time-honored tradition. This year's Platinum Jubilee marks the Queen's unprecedented 70-year reign. But the 96-year-old monarch is scaling back her participation in the four-day festival. Keir Simmons has more from London tonight. Keir? We all get nervous the night before a party. So imagine being the queen tonight. For 70 years, since her coronation, she's had one role, and the UK has had one queen. Tomorrow, outside Buckingham Palace, a front row seat to history. I'm 70 years old, sleeping on the cobbles in London. The Queen may be too frail to attend many events, like tomorrow's traditional military parade, trooping the colour. 1,500 troops, 350 horses, and most of them have never done this before. This pageantry is the envy of the world. How do they get it so right? They rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. Rehearsals have been going on for weeks, including for one special dog, Seamus. Are you excited to meet the Queen? The Irish Guards, regimental mascot. The secret for you guys is rehearsal, 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 right? Yeah, and yeah. And that's true for the dog too? It's, it's the exact same for the dog. He needs to know what he's doing. 
Like all our families, there are inevitably tensions when the royal family gathers. Harry and Meghan reportedly arrive today. But for the next few days, Queen and country will come together. And children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. With smiles and happy hearts and the quiet acknowledgement that as a beloved relative gets older, time is precious. Keir Simmons, NBC News, London. Lovely. Thank you for making time for us uh, this evening. NBC's Jacob Ward will be your host tomorrow night. I'm Harry Smith. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.